So welcome everyone to this little live session on a Friday morning. I must admit, we had a little staff party yesterday. Not a party, but uh, we were cupping coffees from my own farm <laughs> together with the staff. And of course, we had to celebrate my friend Diego, who just won the World Barista Championship as well. So if I'm a little rusty today, might be because of that. But, you know, bear with me. So today we're actually going to do some uh, roasting on the Rust sample roaster. I'm not sure what you call it in English. Is it roast or Rust? Yeah. Uh, it's supposed to be an O with a line through, so Rust. Um, this is the sample roaster that I use. I use it you know, many times during a week, especially during coffee buying season, which we are approaching very soon. And uh, typically, you know, when I get samples from Finca Tamala, for instance, I just received that uh, a, over a month ago, and uh, it was over 80 samples. So obviously, there's a lot of roasting on this machine. So it needs to be very stable. Uh, the reason why I cho chose to use this one is because it's programmable, of course. Uh, so I can make my own profiles. I'll show a little bit about that on the computer. And uh, of course, when you have a program profile, it will repeat it over and over again. And especially when I have you know, 40 to 80 samples from one farm, uh, they're pretty similar. So it's pretty easy to roast over and over and over again with this roaster. And you know, I just bought my second one. It's not this one. I think they're building it now. But uh, I just realized that I need more capacity because I do get a lot of samples from time to time. And you know, I could just do half the time roasting. Um, it has uh, something called first crack detection, which I actually love. Uh, it's supposed to help me with automation, so it will automatically detect when the beans start to crack. Um, for those of you who don't know what that is, that's when the beans have such high steam pressure inside that the cell structure kind of breaks, and you'll hear it like pop popcorn, it's kind of popping or cracking. Uh, the machine will detect that, but it doesn't kind of start the development time timer until five cracks have, have uh, been detected. So um, that's kind of a good security for me in case I'm sitting on my computer uh, answering emails or whatever, and then I'm just letting the roaster do its work. And then if I'm a little uh, unfocused, the machine can actually detect the cracks and finish the roast for me. So what I'll do then is just program the development time, uh, a normal development time for my coffees, which is normally 100 gram samples, is 50 to 60 seconds. It depends a little bit on which coffee it is. So the machine will then detect, you know, after five cracks, it'll start that timer and count down 55 seconds. And once it's done, it lets the coffee out and it starts to cool the coffee, which is pretty cool. Having said that, I use it as a safety net, but uh, sometimes uh, I do have a lot of samples that are quite dry. So let's say around 9% moisture, for instance, which I don't mind. I actually prefer that to having a sample that's too high moisture. I think they're more stable, the shelf life. Uh, they're not more difficult to roast. You just have to roast them slightly different than a high moisture coffee. And um, what happens when you have very low moisture? There's not a lot of you know, water in the beans, so you don't generate a lot of steam pressure in the beans. So you might not get this kind of very distinct cracking and the machine might not detect those very, very subtle cracks. So uh, it still detects cracks, but uh, you kind of have to follow as well. So I like to have a little buzz around. When it reaches a certain temperature, the machine will give me a little beep. So then it means I need to go over to the machine and maybe watch the sample get finished. I really like using this roaster because you have a little trier. You can take the beans out course that's going to suck a lot of air in so you don't want to do it too much but because it's round at the end here you can kind of keep the trier in the hole so you don't get too much air in and you can watch the bean as they develop because when you do samples and many times you just get 100 grams uh, sent to you by an exporter you only have one chance to roast it um, you kind of need to watch and feel a little bit as well like the artisanal way uh, so it's fully, uh, it's fully possible to do automation on this, but I still love the fact that I can interact with the coffee uh, and kind of smell it and look at it. Cool. I said that I normally roast uh, 100 gram samples, but uh, recently, last week, so I've been doing 50 gram samples. And that's because uh, I received samples from my own farm. I didn't want to waste too much of that coffee. 
but I wanted to sample all the different pickings that we did. We had, I think, 20 or 30 samples. Uh, so I did 50 gram samples of each on this roaster. And of course, I couldn't use the same profile as I would do on a 100 gram sample because uh, there is a different momentum in 100 grams of beans than 50 grams of beans. So what I actually had to do then it was to raise the RPM so you can, there's some paddles in here that moves around, moves the coffee around. And by raising the uh, rounds per minute, the coffee would move a little bit faster, but that means more of the beans would be kind of stirred up to here where it's most efficiently roasted because the, the fan is kind of inside the machine and there's some uh, openings here. So it kind of blows the air from here up to the top. So you kind of want to have the beans in that air if you want to get them to roast. Of course, when you have more beans, you can have a little bit less RPM because you're always going to have beans there anyway. So that's one thing that I played around with. Uh, and when I did that, I didn't really had, have to change the way I uh, approached it with the temperature. So I'm not sure if you can see this, but um, let's see. When you get a rest, you get a login to their website. This is different uh, profiles that I made. So I have one that I call Kenya Test One. That's my favorite profile. It works for everything. <laughs> and that's kind of my most used profile. So if I have a new sample that I don't really know what is, I can use that profile. And most of the times that coffee will be, you know, maybe not perfectly roasted, but roasted well enough so that I can actually evaluate the quality of the coffee. Uh, I don't use a sample roaster to kind of perfect my roasting or to achieve the perfect roast. I mainly use this roaster for uh, tasting samples from producers, potential coffees that I'm going to buy. And if I feel that the coffee was not developed fully uh, or was a little too roasty or maybe a little bit too dark, I normally will roast it again. And now if I only get a 100 gram sample from the producer, I can do 50 gram samples, so I can have two goes on one sample. I have programmed uh, the air temperature, which the, the roaster has different sensors inside. There's something called the bean temperature, but you're not really measuring the temperature of the bean. It's just a probe that is placed where the most majority of the beans are. But you're really measuring the temperature of that probe. That's what you're measuring. You're not measuring the bean temperature. So. Uh, you know, on a bigger roaster, that's a little bit more safe to steer around because you have much more beans inside the roaster. And normally that probe is like fully submerged into the bean mass. But on a, a small sample ro roaster like this, I don't feel confident that I'll get 100% accurate reading on that probe. So for me, I'm actually using more of the air temperature uh, probes, which is located, I think, a little bit further up. That means I'm measuring the actual air temperature inside the roaster. Uh, and normally I'll start at 200 degrees and it moves quite slowly and I think my peak on this profile is 235 degrees Celsius uh, and that's around where you start to hear first crack and then it actually goes down a little bit because uh, I just feel like if I'm too high on the temperature you very often get quite roasty coffee with the kind of undeveloped inside so it's a, both a little green in flavor but also a little roasty. So I've tweaked a little bit on the 50 gram uh, profile where it's a little bit lower in temperature in general, but uh, just slightly, just a few degrees. I think I ended up at like 232 for a short while and then down to 220, I think. You can also uh, adjust the fan speed. So that means how fast the air moves through the beans and obviously less fan speed means less efficiency uh, and there's a heating element here so the machine is kind of measuring the air temperature when I make the air temperature profile and it turns on and off the heating element to make sure that I'm at that temperature that I've programmed so if you increase the fan speed obviously you're going to cool down the probe a little bit so it means it will turn on the heating element more so you get a more efficient uh, roasting so you can there's a lot of things you can play around with this uh, roaster Personally, I like to keep it very simple. Uh, I feel that if you change too many parameters at one time, you are just going to get much more confused. So for instance, just you know, stick to one RPM on the paddles, maybe stick to one fan speed, and then you, you change the temperatures. Or if you are really confident with your 
temperature curve, then you can start playing with RPMs on the pedals or maybe the fan speeds. And that's kind of how I work with this roster. I do have a couple of uh, specific profiles as well, like for instance when I receive samples from the Caballero family in Honduras, uh, those coffees are really well processed. They're dried in shade, so the beans are quite dense. Uh, so I have a slightly different profile for those coffees. And especially when those coffees are fresh, they roast a little bit differently than if two or three months later I receive the actual coffee. It's been rested a little bit, uh, then maybe I'll go back to my Kenya test profile that works for everything. So, and I also have a profile for Tamana coffees now, but I made that on my old roaster, which was, I think, one of the first releases from uh, Rust. And uh, they have changed a lot in this roaster since then. So I upgraded my roster to a new one and uh, the profiles were slightly different. So uh, my goal now for the winter is to make good solid profiles for each producer that I buy from so that I can kind of know what to go for. And then if that doesn't work, I always have that Kenya test profile to go after. And that's just a simple, quite slow increasing temperature profile. Very easy. I feel like people tend to overcomplicate roasting a little bit. It's, you know, coffee beans that needs to go brown. Uh, and of course, if the temperature is too high, you're going to score it. If it's too low, you're going to underdevelop it. So uh, keep it simple. That's uh, my best advice. You don't have to do a lot of adjustments all the time. Let the machine do that for you. Just make a very simple curve. Um, yes. Is there anything else that I should talk about? Before we roast, maybe. So there's a live view as well. Uh, if I go to my roaster, I have two roasters here. One is a secret one that I'm giving away very soon. Uh, and the other one is my roaster. And if I go to live, it'll start logging as soon as I start roasting. So maybe we should do that and then we can answer some questions if we have some. Yes, let's do that. So today I'm roasting three different samples. It's always good to kind of know what you're roasting before you start. This is obviously a washed coffee, but I have one here that looks like it's more of a honey process. Uh, when I smell it, it smells a little vinegary, so that means this is probably a coffee that's fermented a little bit. Might not be a honey process, but uh, I approach those coffees slightly different. So for instance, if I have a natural or a honey, I know that the end color of that coffee needs to be a little bit lighter than my washed coffees. Why? Hmm. Maybe because the silver skin is not there as dominant anymore, so you don't get that kind of white spot. So when you measure color, you only measure average color. So if you have a lot of white stuff in the coffee, obviously you need to have the color darker. Cool. So coffee goes in, you start just by raising this lever, that's it. And then you'll see immediately, this is my profile. Uh, this is a 50 gram profile, so that's not going to work. I forgot to change the profile on my roaster, but you know, it doesn't matter. Let's see how this works. Maybe we can actually roast this as well. Um, but basically you have to go into the roaster and just select the profiles and you can download five profiles at a time and if you're sick and tired of those profiles you just go into the computer and you select the profiles that you want to download to the roaster and it, you know, it takes 30 seconds to do that. That's pretty easy. Uh, now I can see the red line. That's the kind of live, I'm not sure if you can see it, but the red line on my logging. Let's put it here. So the blue line is kind of the, <laughs> the ideal and the, the red line is uh, the bean temperature. So there's a gray line there, uh, that's kind of the recipe. The blue line is trying to follow that recipe and that's the live and the red line is the bean temperature. We have a green line going very much up and then down, that's the rate of rise. I know a lot of you are very focused on the rate of rise. It just tells you the speed of how fast that red line is going. You know, so it's not uh, necessarily the holy grail of roasting, uh, but it is another curve that you can use, of course. 
So I prefer, you know, to more look at the, the, the bean temperature or the air temperature. It doesn't really matter. And uh, having said that, a rate of rise curve will look extremely different depending on the roaster, how thick the probe is, where it's placed, how much coffee you have in. So there's not kind of an ultimate curve for anything. Uh, every machine is slightly different and so on. One of the cool things though is that I have this roaster now and then I bought another one. Uh, so what Rust is doing then is to calibrate those roasters so that they're very similar. So that's, I highly recommend if you consider getting two, just get them straight away so that they can be very similar. That means you know that when you send a profile to both roasters, they will be more or less exactly the same. And the reason why they might be slightly different is not necessarily that the roaster is different or anything, but you won't believe how much difference there is in thermocouples. Like, uh, if you buy 10 of the same brand, they might give you many different data. And the guys at the rest actually showed me this when they bought thermocouples. They got so sick and tired of them because they were so inconsistent. So I think they're making their own now. Is that true? I think they are. Yeah, they are. And that's just because you're so depending on these precise measurements and then you're buying imprecise tools to measure, which is not good. So that's, I think, why they start making their own. All right, three minutes in and you can see the coffee is getting uh, what a lot of people call Maillard stage. But the Maillard stage is going on, you know, after like 150 degrees, it's going on all the time. There's no scientific evidence that if you stretch this phase that the coffee will be sweeter and more flavorful. Actually, Morten Munchau at Coffee Mind, who is a researcher and he researched a lot of roasting, he suggests that it's more likely to appear, all these chemical things, if you speed up the process, and that means more energy, the more these molecules are going to move around, the more likely it is that you will have better caramelization and all these kind of things. So, can I use the rust to make a profile and then take it to my 35 kilo lowering? No, that's not how it works. Uh, I don't think you can do that with any roasting machine because roasting 100 grams is a very, very different discipline than roasting 30 kilos. Just because the mass of 30 kilos is so different than the mass of 100 grams. I can get an indication on how to approach the roasting maybe but uh, I find these roasters to be so different that uh, I don't really use it for that at all. I use it more to understand what qualities the green coffee actually has, how it actually tastes like. And then when I do test roast on my big roaster, because we do that, we do full batches, tests, and then we cut them side by side with the rest to see, you know, is there more potential in the production roast? Is there something we need to change? We look at the profile. That's kind of how we work. Um, I don't really use this for, like, ob obviously I'm not competing as a barista or anything anymore, so I don't use the roaster for, you know, roasting for competition. But you could. At least nowadays when a lot of the competitions, you just need a, you know, not a lot of coffee to compete. So uh, you could actually roast uh, 100 gram samples and use those in various competitions if you wanted to. I'm not sure I would do that myself, but uh, I just, I would probably prefer to have more of that coffee to practice with. But of course you could just repeat the roast over and over and over again if you wanted to. So that, it is a possibility for sure. All right, it started cracking and it already counted five cracks. So you can see my uh, development time timer. It's a countdown timer, it already started. It also has a development time timer on the side where it's kind of going upwards so that you know how many seconds in your development you are. And then you have the kind of timer to when the coffee is going to go out. All of the time the roaster is adjusting. Now let me see. This coffee looks pretty good. So maybe my 50 gram uh, sample profile is better for my 100 gram samples as well. Who knows? This is, I don't really theorize too much when I uh, make profiles like this. I just do it by trial and error. It looks really good actually. 
That looks actually pretty good. I'm not sure if you can see that, but uh, it looks like a fully developed uh, coffee for sure. Didn't crack a lot. Uh, maybe the moisture is a little low on this sample. I didn't measure it because it's not a sample that I'm going to buy. Uh, but it is a sample that I'm going to taste for sure. It's actually a cup of excellence sample from Colombia. Uh, so I just wanted to taste that. Uh, the development time is the question. How do I approach that? Um, it really depends a little bit on the coffee. Uh, normally, my total time is normally not more than six and a half minutes. And sometimes it's even faster. It really depends on the moisture content of the coffee. If the moisture content is a little high, I might stretch the development time a little bit, but I'm rarely more than 65 seconds. That's, you know, I can't even remember the time that I've gone over that. Uh, and I'm very rarely below 45 seconds. 45 seconds I could do on a natural, for instance, from Ethiopia, uh, where I use a lot of energy in the beginning to kind of get the coffee going. And I feel like those coffees are tasting better when they're really light in color. And uh, it's normally pretty easy to develop on this roaster. So I could go 45 to 50 second development time on a coffee like that. But it also depends a little bit on the moisture content, of course. Uh, so higher moisture content, normally a little bit longer. And then uh, maybe a honey coffee, uh, which I don't roast a lot of, but I do get them from El Salvador. Maybe that will be more like a 50 second development time. And then a uh, fully washed coffee, shade dried, like from Finca Tamana or Caballeros, I would go 55 to 60 seconds normally. I, I'm normally, you know, it sounds like that's a very, very short period, but uh, there's a lot of stuff happening in that period. And, um, of course, the, the, the temperature is quite high, it's 220 plus degrees. So um, I kind of watch the coffee and see, you know, okay, now it's the time. And uh, normally uh, I'm very careful of getting this kind of more oily shine to it. I'm not talking about, you know, the oils that you see after second crack. But uh, I, yeah, it's kind of a training thing. You have to watch the beans and see, you know, when you feel like now they're fully developed without being too dark you end the roast there. So that's my approach. It's a bit touch and feel, I think. Of, of course, if you have these kind of anaerobic coffees or stuff like that, which I don't roast a whole lot of because I'm not a huge fan of those, but uh, then uh, it's a little bit different, I guess. So uh, you would have to watch. One thing that uh, you have to be a little aware of, and I was talking about development time on coffees that have very low moisture, if you use the first crack detection, like on this coffee, I suspect this to be quite low moisture because we only registered five cracks in total. Uh, so sometimes you will just hear very subtle cracks and uh, the machine doesn't really register. So then you have the option of just pushing the button and say, okay, I believe the coffee is starting to crack now. It has reached the temperature. You can normally see it on the bean probe as well that it gets a little dip in the temperature. So. Uh, you have to kind of be a little bit hands-on with samples, at least if you don't know the coffee from before. How do I decide when I end the roast? Well, it's kind of already decided on the development time that I've set. So I know it's going to end within, you know, 55 seconds on these samples. Uh, normally I can oversteer it as well if I feel like it's not there yet. But I, I basically look at the coffee. Uh, you also kind of hear it cracking. If it's not cracking a lot, which can happen with small samples, it's basically looking at it. Yeah, you can just smell a little bit, but uh, looking at it. Have like a reference to a color that you are comfortable with cupping. Uh, so that means having a roasted sample next to it just to kind of have something to compare with. And that's how you decide. And you can use the trier. Obviously, try, try not to take, take it out too much because it's going to suck in a lot of cold air into the roaster. Uh, obviously, the roaster will compensate by heating more, but uh, you kind of need, need to avoid that as much as you can. But you can also watch the color through the window, but I, I actually prefer just taking small samples every now and then, and then just push the button when I'm ready. Uh, so that's kind of how I do it. We're roasting up to 35 kilos. The majority of the time it's 30 kilo batches. 
And the total time there is normally between 10 and 11 minutes. Sometimes slightly longer, sometimes slightly shorter. But normally it's between 10 and 11. That goes for espresso as well. Um, you can go faster, uh, of course. Uh, depends. If you have smaller batches, you can go faster. Um, but if you roast on a rust for 11 minutes, at least I don't get very good results with that. I normally get quite flat coffees. Uh, I get maybe a little baked coffees, so I prefer to go much faster. Um, it's very powerful, so you can uh, roast way too fast, and you're just going to end up with quite a roasty surface and green insides. So you don't want to do that either. But uh, normally I'm between four and a half to six and a half minutes. And the reason why it's such a big gap, that's two minutes, is because some coffees, they're really dry, and uh, they might not need as much time in the roaster. Other coffees are a little bit more moist, so they need more power and more time in the roaster. Uh, but when you have a kind of profile like that, it's almost like it, it, it lives on its own. Like, let's say I roasted 10 samples with this profile. Some will be high moisture, some will be low. The, the total time will range maybe between five and a half to six and a half minutes. And that sounds like a huge difference, and it is. But, uh, you know, some of the coffees will start to have first crack a little bit later than the others. It doesn't mean that the roaster is inconsistent. It means your samples are not the same. Uh, because the roaster is perfectly able to repeat the hot air temperature. But uh, if there's more water in the beans, obviously you need more energy to get that water to heat up. And that's why it takes a longer time. You can oversteer it if you want. You can just go in and uh, say, I want more power now. You're, it's, that's perfectly fine. I just feel like for the purpose of what I'm using this roaster for, which is sample roasting, meaning I roast samples to taste if I'm going to buy the coffee or not, then uh, you don't really need to overcomplicate it too much. It's about you know, roasting the coffee that is developed so that you can actually taste the attributes in the coffee. It's not too roasty, it's not too light. And then of course, it's never gonna be 100% perfect. But if you see the potential there, you can buy the coffee and then get it to taste even better when you start produ producing it on a bigger roaster. So I would say, you know, typically on a one kilo roaster, maybe my times in the past on the kilo roasters that I've used, uh, they might be like seven to nine minutes. Uh, on a 15 kilo roaster, we were around 10 to 11, 12 minutes. On our loring, it's a little bit more efficient. So between nine and 11 minutes. So, um, yeah, but normally we're between 10 and 11 minutes on our loring. You have to also remember that this is a hot air roaster, so it's more efficient than it, if it was a drum roaster. A drum roaster uses a lot of uh, conductive heat, which means contact heat from the beans to the drum, as well as hot air. But this is a 100% hot air roaster. Um, and, you know, it's like when you make uh, bread in a hot air oven it's more efficient than if you have a, a radiation oven. So, um, yeah, hot air is, for me at least, a better way to roast because it's more efficient and takes, I, I feel like it, I can develop the coffees a little bit better and more easily in a roaster like that. It doesn't mean that a drum roaster is bad, it's just, uh, it's a different discipline to roast on, on a drum roaster, uh, for sure. My first thing would be to look at the profile. Um, if it's a very slow profile, you might want to speed it up. If it's too fast, you might want to slow it down. So maybe on a rust, I think you know the recommended time would be probably between five and seven minutes, at least no more than eight minutes probably. Uh, so if you're slower than that, you're probably not putting enough energy into it. So you can still get like a roasty coffee, but it will taste a little green as well, maybe a little flat. If it's very kind of green and astringent, you might be roasting a little too fast.